Hi, I'm Diana Marzalek. I'm with Provoke Media. Uh, I have, we are here today to talk about modern brand belief. Um, we have two guests today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, our first guest, Patrick uh, Sully Sullivan, is from Imre. Hello, Patrick. Hi, nice to be here. I'm the Executive Creative Director at Emory Agency. And we have Lauren Feynman. Lauren? Hi, I am a Senior Director of Communications at P&G Ventures. P&G Ventures is the startup studio with Procter & Gamble. My team's responsibility is influencer marketing, credentialing, public relations, and brand building. Excellent. So I'm looking forward to a lively conversation because a lot of this is around brands and creativity, which can go all kinds of ways. So. Um, we will get started given our overall topic um, is the concept of brand belief. Um, what is brand belief? How would you categorize what that is? You know, in a, in a lot of ways, we talk about brand belief as the evolution of brand love. And we think about it as a really critical measurement when, you know, consumers are really cynical these days and, and the culture kind of quiets a lot of brands that aren't relevant. and. In a lot of ways, people are looking to not just buy products, but they're looking to buy into something that's greater. And that's really where belief centers is people's willingness to take that leap with brands, to engage with them, to participate with their marketing ideas, and to really advocate for them as you would advocate for a, a good friend uh, who's trying to get into the pool down the street, right? And it's, it's such a new space for us um, that we study, but it is rooted in those classic um, senses of trust and uh, persuasion and of course, brand love. Right. Lauren, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's the, really the evolution with the relationship with the brand too. Like, I think it, it requires the brand to have a lot more responsibility. They have a responsibility to the person um, and they have a responsibility to those person's beliefs. And so I think it's really taking it to the next level. I think it's really been with the evolution of direct to consumer and that opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with your consumer. So it's, um, it's, it's exciting time for brand building. I wonder though about the discovery process or for lack of a better word, especially for, for you, Lauren, where you're, you're dealing with new brands, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you would be dealing with new brands and products. How do you know what a brand, what a consumer is going to want to believe in? You know, where is the starting process for developing that aspect, that relationship um, with a consumer and a brand? Part of it, I mean, one thing we do, we talk to a lot of consumers and what's their value system and what do they believe and what do they need to know? But I think um, they look to the value system of the company launching that brand as well. And so we need to be very consistent with that. So when, within P&G Ventures, we have a series of individuals that are the founders of the brand. And often that, found, those, that group of individuals really give, set the tone and the belief system of the brand. Um, and so that's been really um, a key thing as we choose the right people to have that relationship with the consumer. We have a women's wellness brand and that was all started by women. We have, a, you know, we have um, brands that work on you know, non-toxic, home, say for brown people and pets. And so we have people that are very passionate about that space. And so I think that really helps with giving that authenticity that is necessary because um, consumers see through the fraud. Right, and Sully? And I really love where that comes in, Lauren, is just the idea that the first step to really making people believe is to show you have an interest in them, is to listen. And you know, we use empathy as a device, not just in our creative process, but in our uh, research process as well, and to really get into the motivations uh, that people have, um, to really step into the market, to advocate for a new brand. Um, and we find that belief can shape the purpose of a brand ultimately. When you get people on board and they're believing in your brand, it, it, it measures in the market. And that's where a lot of our spidey senses go out in the initial phases of deployment, it's like, what are people saying? Where are the gaps? And, and you can look at things like the sandwich wars, the chicken sandwich wars, something as, as loose and ephemeral as that. People get behind it. People spend time with it. People are advocating for the best chicken sandwich that they can find. And it's not just a fly-by-night thing. It, it's really the currency of modern brand marketing is that that sense of belief and being able to capture it and then convert it into a customer base. Well, so, you know, we used to talk at them and now we need to talk with them. 
You right. know, you, we only had television advertising. We just talked at the consumer. We would tell her, in our case, mostly females, women's head to household, what they wanted and what they needed and how, what the right way to do things were. That is no longer acceptable. You know, we really need to talk with her or him and have that relationship. Um, and I think that's been really, that's been a, definitely an evolution since I've been working in this space. And that conversation continues, right? I mean, you can launch a brand and that conversation continue forever. And the brand's relationship and the brand belief can change over time. Yes, yes. Um, Sully, I, I like that you brought up the chicken wars, <laughs> the big chicken sandwich wars, um, which speaks to something that you and I discussed last time we talked, which was brand belief versus brand purpose. Um, versus people also, or not necessarily versus, but also in light of people sometimes just wanting a little levity from their brands. Um, we're very much mired in having purpose um, in driving missions at this point, but it's okay to have a chicken sandwich war at the same time. It, it's amazing the things that we care about in culture with all the things happening. It really comes down to who's got the best chicken sandwich and who's gonna advocate for it. And in a lot of ways you can see belief is a multiplier, right? Once you unlock sort of that secret sauce behind the tension, um, creatively, you can bring those believers inside of the brand, right? They become part of the brand. They get to build it with you. And kind of what Lauren was saying is once you stop talking at someone and you start talking with them, they want to play with your idea. And, and that was always the test for us is, is not just someone engaging or getting an impression, but did someone participate with that idea and move it forward and build it? And you see social platforms like Twitter are perfectly suited um, for belief and, and ways to measure that as a brand marketer. And it also speaks to brands are sort of living entities, right? Um, it can change. You can push for a chicken sandwich one day and stand up for you know, racial equality the next, right? It's like, a, it's, it's a human being, it's not a human being, but obviously, but it is a fully 360 functioning entity in some degrees. Right, it's not what they say, it's what they do. And brand behavior is definitely a way to prove out belief um, because, you know, you may say that you're behind BIPOC, but if you don't actually have activities that support that, it falls really false and you actually, as a consumer feel um, completely slighted and, and you feel like the rug's been pulled under from you. So you, the rejection of belief um, with an inauthentic brand has such a whiplash in cancel culture markets that you have to be really careful about how honest you are and embrace that truth about your brand as you go to market. Yeah, there's a, a line between you have to be that honest and authentic and yet there is a risk. Like social media has is a very risky medium, right? You make whether it's you make one small move or one influencer says whatever, it's that's hard to navigate. It's very hard. I think that's the hardest thing about this is, you know, you always have to be on your game. And there's not, unfortunately, not a lot of room for forgiveness until you have people that are so passionate about your brand. I think that is when you know you've reached the right situation is when you have a group of followers that are so passionate about the brand, they allow the brand to be human and make a mistake mm -hmm. and stand up for it and course correct them, the brand and, the, and that mistake. Um, but it's scary until you can get there. <laughs> yeah, because it's a fine line between you want to put yourself out there, you want to be provocative, you want to get attention, but oops, like, <laughs> again, I mean, I love it's humor. a lot of grief. Humor loves, I mean, but humor can go wrong too, right? Like right. So, so Sally said, it's like humor is amazing. Consumers need that levity in their life. I mean, it's a chicken sandwich, right? right. But humor can go wrong. And I and think so we've all seen that. And, and so that, it is, as you know, it is, a, it is a very exciting space to be in right now. Do you guys I think just, the other like, thing is- your head so explode? You want to have like humor? You want to have purpose? You want to say it the right way? I mean- Well, you know, and you know, with, with the pandemic, I mean, people are tired, right? But also they want to see behind the curtain. I think, you know, more and more, they want to see that innovation, that, that technology, that why, that, and they want to see, they want, they're not- as accepting of the beliefs. They're not blindly accepting the, the data, the beliefs, the claims. And so they really wanna be taken on the journey with the brand, either the evolution of the brand's personality or the evolution of the brand's claims and why they should fall in love with it. And what is, I know this is a, a sort of 
far reaching question, but what is the creative, how do you take all that and, and make a creative process? <laughs> um, how do you, what is the creative process to support all these things and weigh all these things? It's, um, it's a lot. So my background is mostly in innovation communication. Okay. So, you know, I, I was a scientist by training and moved in this area about 20 years ago. Um, and we, you know, we really, really follow the same process you do when you, you know, you're trying to get new science out there. We like take them early on the journey, help them understand why the technology is what it is or why the product performs that way. And really use the whole communication model from the, you know, the inventors, the early adopters before we even go into the mainstream and really help our, our fans, our friends share that story and share that belief. So it, 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 for me, that's really exciting. And I think with the, with the pandemic and the whole conversation of like the development of the vaccine, consumers wanted to know. And so, you know, like I find my mother talking about things like, you know, PPE, she's 85 years old. Like when I think my 85 year old mother was going to know what PPE was. Right. And so I think there, there is that ability to learn more, but there's also that ability to learn the wrong things with um, the internet. Yes, the internet does have its issues. <laughs> Sully? It, it, it's, hard, it, it's hard for brand marketers to spend years building a brand and, and building an audience and building a unique selling proposition within a very specific niche in the market and then set it free. But that is the reality of, of modern brand belief and modern marketing is that um, if you love it, you have to let it go and let the people play with it and build it and send it back to you, hopefully better than what you had it. And I think, you know, you can reference the chicken sandwich wars as, as this sort of ongoing ephemeral thing, but the, the amount of love and belief in those brands because they embrace the truth behind it, which is there's always a better chicken sandwich right around the corner and you have fun with that idea. It shows also your sensibility as a marker, marketer that you understand your audience. You're not taking it too seriously. You're not using puffery to oversell what actually is between the buns <laughs> and, and, and you let it go and you let culture embrace it. Or in some cases, culture will cancel it. And you have to be resolute in the fact that both are actually wins both you learn from, but one has a better commercial application, obviously, but that's the reality of, of, of the world we're living in now. And you're yeah. both starting these processes with companies at, at different stages, which doesn't mean so that you don't work with, with startups, but Lauren, you're starting with entrepreneurs with new businesses starting out and you are creating the brand. Mm -hmm. And yes. so you get clients who are maybe been in it a while. <laughs> Uh, um, something either is or isn't working. Um, are those two very different processes, I imagine? You know, they both are evolved, you know, so, you know, I work at PN Parcher and Gamble and that's, you know, I've worked on huge brands. I've worked on Olay, I've worked on Tide. And um, when you work on a huge brand like that, you still are evolving it because your, your consumer's evolving. And I think you still need to respect, be respectful to ultimately you are in service of what they want and what they need. Um, so it is a little different. I think the risk is different. Um, when you have a big brand, you can't, you cannot take as much risk because you can lose something that's very large. When you're when it's small and it's a startup, you get to have a little bit more fun and, and learn and go. And I think that's you know it's like a child, right? You you don't really know where that child's going to end up, but then as you know, and so you can kind of try new things on. As an adult, we have our own brand. Right. And so when we do something that's off brand, it confuses people and we have to kind of like connect the dots for people. It, you know, I really do look at as brands as, as, as almost like living dynamic things that can that get just to grow and evolve. Right. And is that um, how do your entrepreneurs take to this process? Are, are they ready for it? Do they even get it? Do they know what's coming? Yeah, they do. They, they really enjoy it. They, um, you know, a lot of it's data driven, right? You know, you know, you're, a lot of it is you know learning direct to, direct to consumer data analytics, understanding the needs, being in that one to one contact with consumers. We're constantly on social media, watching what they say. Probably no different than Sully is listening to their voice, listening to what they want. Um, 
you know, you kind of feel like your parent. We always say like when it starts to grow and it gets to a size where you're starting to really build it, make it bigger, you kind of need to send it off to, we would say boarding school. Like you kind of <laughs> trust it to, you know, that's what Sully said. He's trusting it to the people to kind of take it and grow it to the next level. When you send your child to school, you're kind of, or college, you're trusting that environment to be able to grow it into this functioning adult. And so um, I think it's really exciting. It is exciting. And so I'm sure it's equally exciting working with established brands and, um, but there's probably different nuances there too, right? I mean, you may have some brand belief that maybe it's not working or you need to change or embellish or it has its own challenges. You know, at, at Emory, we work with um, clients that are very established and also some straight out of the gates in healthcare and, and consumer fields um, and everything in between. And what we find is that there's always a kernel of truth behind the brand that people will embrace. And we build um, equity around that truth. Um, and sometimes it can be a purpose for a brand. Sometimes it can be a unique innovation in the technology, but we really hone in on that and try and simplify a communication ecosystem that draws attention to it, that makes it relevant. And that works if you're talking about you know, John Deere um, a client of ours that we've had for almost 15 years, someone we've worked a long time with uh, on a global level, or, you know, a new client that we get in a new business pitch, you know, we're going to take the same approach to, to make that truth kernel stand out and be the, the foundation for that brand belief construct for, for people to wrap their arms around it and take it into the market with them. Because like Lauren said, it, it's, it's like a little kid that you're raising up. That, that goes off to college and comes back with some uh, new, you know, new attitude or new slang, right? And, and you sort of need to keep embracing that and, and making sure that, that culture embraces it too. And you two have both worked in the field for a long time. And Sully, I know you came from, I believe, advertising as well previously. You worked in I've, I've spent about 20 years uh, advertising agency side. I also spent some time as a global creative director at Marriott International. So, uh, a lot in the travel and uh, entertainment fields as well. So what's it like as a professional, as a creative, both of you going from um, making the transition from these mediums that are a little more static, like advertising, to these living, breathing social media out of control. <laughs> it's on its own. I mean, that's a hard, that's a mindset too, right? It's not just the entity. It's not just the output. Then I Go ahead, Sally. No, please. Go ahead, Lauren. So for me, you know, I started as a bench lab chemist, right? So you really made you really made a transition. I really, but the, you know, the thinking isn't that different now. And you know, so when I first started in the public relations area in the 2000s, I was doing science communication. So how do we talk about our science in the way to really create this brand love and trust with our with our the women we serve, the consumer we serve? But then as I've gone into the much more the broader the brand building, using a broader set of tools in the toolkit, it's with with the opportunity now we really use that same discipline. I think the whole industry is using that same discipline. You know, you know, we set up an experiment. We test our ideas, we test our hypothesis, and we learn and we grow because we want to have, we don't, we don't wing it, right? I think, you know, you, you see the old TV shows in the 1950s and how they used to do the advertising pitch. Well, obviously I wasn't working then, but it was much more like it was the, the owner's belief and they got to make the choice of what their consumer was going to hear. Now the consumer tells us. Mm -hmm. So we, it is really this, it's not really that different. It's still a very different disciplined approach to understanding what, what she or he want, want us to be and what they want to hear um, and making sure we stay true to ourselves and true to them. And, and it's such a, a, a personal journey too. I, I think when you look at traditional advertising mediums, right? It, it's as Lauren was said, you, there's a lot of speaking at people instead of trying to connect with them on a personal level and, and social platforms especially are, are highly customized and highly personal. I mean, think about what you do the first thing in the morning when you wake up and roll over, right? You're in people's news feeds, right? You're in an intimate space. So you have to um, connect with them and grow a relationship in a totally different way. And I think as a storyteller um, by nature, it, and, and our whole industry is really about storytelling and narrative. You have to pick the moments um, to tell part of your story in the right way that really connects with the heart and then hits them 
um, with the rationale that hits the head when they're in the aisle, right? In that, that first, moment, first moment of truth or, you know, a zero moment of truth when you're online and you're about to buy a product um, and there's three other com competitors, right? And you tap into some of those moments when you could be personal with people. And we hope that that's the thing that pushes them over the line and makes that, um, makes that purchase. I want to return to something you said a few minutes ago, and that was that even if you're canceled, it's still a win. You, you know, cancel doesn't mean you're gone and done forever. There's a lot of brands and a lot of people in, in the business that have come back from sort of moments of not their best version of themselves. And I think that that you know, transparency we were talking about and being able to come back from defeat or come back from a, a moment where you weren't your best self. And then, you know, people fall in love with that. It, it's, it's the classic story. You see it in Hollywood. You know, we're all human and so are brands. And embracing that fact um, is going to really resonate with people in the heartstrings, you know, you love to see a comeback story. You love to see the underdog make good. And, and I think that's what people need to understand about cancel culture. It's not final. It's just a commentary on where you need to grow as a brand and as marketers. So it's not that unforgiving. These consumers are not so unforgiving. It sounds like if, if they're, they're going to cancel you, but then they might accept you coming back. I mean, I think they all, <laughs> you hope. I think people see the sides of it and, and you do want, you know, that's where the feedback loop has changed in advertising is that before you couldn't really cancel a, a billboard campaign, yeah. you know, or the TV spot that, that comes in over dinner time. But now it, you're creating a dialogue. So of course, you know, it's not all going to be roses. You have to be prepared for some critique and how you take that critique says as much about yourself as a marketer than anything is, is whether you get defensive or you embrace the opportunity to deepen the dialogue. Yeah, you kind of have to have a thick skin because you don't have to only um, be critiqued by your colleagues, your peers, your bosses, <laughs> your family, but now you've got all these hundreds of thousands of, of people in uh, cyberspace that you have to answer. Yeah, we have to serve them. Right. So, you know, as Sully said, we used to like, you know, we always turned on the TV after dinner and you didn't have a choice. You watched the television ads. Right. And now I have a choice. Right. I either don't watch that that station or I can flip through them or I turn them off or in social media. I don't choose. I can, you know, continue to move on. So we either have to entertain. We have to provide a service. It's, it's actually a higher bar. You know, we have to provide a service. We either entertain or provide content or something, you know, information on something that they care about. And I think that really is a, it's um, it allow. And so when people make a mistake and, and, and they get canceled, people are more forgiving because they recognize it wasn't, um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't intentional. It was an, an, an error of humanity. Mm -hmm. How do we measure all this, especially like a, a company like P&G, you know, that still comes down to, you still have to grow a business, right? I agree. We do measure it. Actually, we do a lot of measurement. We have created some really amazing techniques. A, a person in my organization created a really amazing technique where he's actually able to measure cases in store through influencers, right? And we measure it because we run a lot of experiments. We run single variable experiments when we're doing content and doing create, creative and testing things and then actually measuring not only our click-through rates or engagement rates or reach online, but then we'll actually measure it in store and see if we get lifts in individual stores, hmm. um, you know, bricks and hardware, bricks and mortar stores. And so we do a lot of measurement and we, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, because we need to sell products but two, because we want to understand what was resonating with the consumer. So as you know, these brands are young, right? And so, you know, it does help us understand where that brand needs to be in her, in her life and what that, what service that brand needs to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, p and has all the, the resources to do that. Not every company, I imagine, <laughs> does. Um, a lot of counting. <laughs> so, where does your measurement come in? Or measure come in into your work? You, you know, I mean, certainly some of it's gut. And you can kind of feel if something is, is really bought in by a consumer or you can feel the tenor of the conversation happening in social around a brand or what a brand did. But we actually take a very academic approach. We believe there's around eight key drivers of brand belief and they're very looped in with kind of the wheel of emotions, right? You have innovation, you have integrity, you have trust, reliability, 
um, compassion. And what we think is in this algorithm is probably 40 plus uh, different attributes underneath of those. So you can really find the nuance of integrity. You know, is this about sharing my values? Is this more about, that just makes me really proud to be a part of something. And we can take that and serve that back to our clients in a way that allows them to make better decisions um, on how they spend their time and resources. Cause that's really the game here is when brands know what drivers um, actually push brand belief, they can build blueprints around it. So you think about adjusting perceptions around how the brand is viewed or what it stands for uh, and shows up in the world, right? Those are dials that we can turn when we think about the interactions, you know, consumer and customer experience across channels and touch point. Believe me, you can you can pump up the dialogue there or tone it back if you feel like you're in the, ru- in the wrong forum. Um, even just how you present yourself um, when you think about art and copy, the most classic of all the creative instruments, like sort of dusting up or dusting off your image um, or adding a new aspect of your voice, you know, by pumping up a piece of your personality that people are really responding to. This is part of our creative process. This is how we root and measure brand belief on a level that marketers can take it to the C-suite and, and, and get funding behind it and get plans behind it. And, and that's the level we'd like to take it to. Well, I appreciate and admire um, that part of the creative process for both of you, because it's one thing to go paint a picture, right? <laughs> and feel creative and do your thing. But to have to paint that picture or create that item that it, it embodies all those different elements that you're trying to achieve, um, that's hard. So it, it's sometimes <laughs> kudos to you. <laughs> Well, it's like it, sometimes it can feel like a paint by numbers uh-huh. and that instead of, uh, you know, a masterpiece uh, in, in the sunflower fields, right? And right. I think we try and absorb all of the academic so that when, when we're in the abstract and we're in, you know, creative mode, we're drawing from that, but more unconsciously because you don't want it to be a Frankenstein um, combination of all these things that you think you're supposed to be. It's letting go of those things and embracing who you really are through the creative process that, that makes you punch above your weight class when it comes to brand belief. Um, but then you can also post-rationalize it, which is key to us learning and optimizing the conversation as we go. And, and really embracing that is something we find is a key to success. Excellent. Well, on that note, this was as lively a conversation as I expected. <laughs> I learned a lot. So I appreciate you both being with us and um, we will have the big takeaways from this and and, uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great topic. Always happy to chat about brand belief. Thanks for having us on. Thank you very much. Good to see you. you.